other motives they might have had for going on this journey. But the scripture tells us, Matthew tells us in his gospel, that they were seeking the king of the Jews, and they were seeking him in order to worship him. I suspect they'd already been studying the stars for some time. Why were they studying the stars? They were searching for truth, expectant that more truth might be revealed to them. They were willing, once they saw this star, to leave their comfort zones and go and follow this star to wherever it would take them, believing it was going to be the star representing the king of the Jews. So they were willing to leave comfort and follow this star. The star leads them all the way from the east to Jerusalem. But they're not quite there yet when they get to Jerusalem, are they? They need more revelation. They've had the revelation of the star, but now they need more revelation to find out where this king of the Jews actually is. So they led to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they inquire of the Jewish scholars, those who know the scriptures really well, where the king of the Jews is supposed to be born. And the scholars tell them, quoting Micah, that the king of the Jews is going to be born in Bethlehem. So they search the minds of the scholars who know the Bible. And then the star, I'm imagining, moves on from where it had taken them to Jerusalem on down the road to Bethlehem and to the house where the king of the Jews had been born. And there Matthew tells us, on arrival, they bow down and they worship him. And they give him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All kinds of reasons why people go to church, but really only one in the end, which is the real authentic reason the only legitimate reason to come to church, to bow down and worship the Lord Jesus. Herod wants to worship him too. It's interesting to note, isn't it? But Herod's motives are completely twisted and thwarted. He's, he wants to worship uh, the baby Jesus because he's jealous. He wants to find out where he is and he wants to have him eliminated so he can remain number one. We know that from the story. But the Magi simply hunger to encounter the king of the Jews and bow down and worship him. Now notice a few things here. It seems from this narrative that God is already at work outside and beyond the covenant people of God. God had disclosed himself to the, the Jewish people in the land of Israel. But here, he's sparking off right outside the box, over in the east somewhere. And he's touching the hearts of men who have no knowledge of the history of salvation as disclosed to the people of Israel. But he's sparking off, and he's even revealing himself to them, in part through their study of the stars. God is out there, already at work. Who knows? A house down the road in Bushmead, round the corner from me, could be as remote and distant in real terms from this church as those men in the east were from Bethlehem. At the cultural difference could be absolutely colossal. There may be a Muslim man asleep on his bed at night now, or sleep in his bed in the morning now, who God is seeking to reveal himself to, who may be revealing himself to him in a dream, or in whatever way he chooses, seeking to get into his life. But that man then will need to leave 
his house, come on a trail, and maybe come to this church, and then be told from the Scriptures who this person is, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Just as the Jewish scholars had to explain to the Magi, ah, the King of the Jews, our King of the Jews, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. There's a man here this morning, I know, who's, whose God has touched his heart. And he's brought him out of the wilderness, if you like, and to this church this morning. He was here at Christmas. He needs us now to explain to him the full revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two kinds of revelation then. A natural revelation, a star spotted, and special revelation, the revelation of the Word of God in this story from the book of Micah. We need both kinds of signs. We need signs that are out there at large in God's world, yeah? And we need the Word of God to get the complete picture. Remember the shepherds out there on the fields at night, the angel tells them that there will be a sign given to them. And the sign will be that they will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. That's going to be a sign to them. Just as the star was a sign to the, to, to, to the magi, the wise men. And when they get there, they bow down and they worship the king of the Jews the baby Jesus, whose name means Savior. The simplicity, the utter simplicity of that moment. This baby can't teach them anything. He can't speak yet. This baby can't lay his hands on them. This baby can't lead a small group. This baby can't be put on a rotor. This baby... He's just a baby. But through the sheer presence of his being, he's able to transform the lives of those magi, those men who've traveled so far to come and bow down and worship him. They leave then by another route, you know the story, to avoid uh, trouble with Herod, and who knows what then happens to those men? We just don't know, do we? But I suspect they, they, they go off and they lay hold of the fact that life will never be the same again because they had encountered the king of the Jews as a simple baby. And they had experienced what it means, what it feels like to worship him. So as we move deeper into worship now, let's lay aside anything that might hold us back from the simplicity of simply bowing down and worshipping the King of the Jews, the Saviour of the world, Jesus Christ. Or rather than putting it to one side, whatever might be preventing us from drawing closer in our worship, Let's take whatever it might be that's holding us back and actually place it before the baby Jesus. Whatever it might be that's troubling you, all sorts of things could be troubling you. You might have come to church very angry about something in the church. You might have come to church very angry about something in your family or in your workplace. You might have come to church thinking, I need to know more rather than I need to come and worship. These men, these magi, simply left their homes to travel, to find the king, to bow down, to worship him. In a way, we need to be like sniffer dogs. 
we get a whiff of the truth. And then we need to follow the trail, follow the trail, follow the trail, till we find the king, till we bow down and we worship him. And whatever might then follow, whatever swamps God might call us into to rescue people from, if we haven't first encountered the living God and worshipped him, we're probably not going to be much use in the swamp. We'll probably be drawn down into it. But let's come now intentionally, as Andrew leads us forward, let's come now into the sparkling clean water, the stream. Yeah? And let's seek to worship the Lord God. You might even like to do what the Magi did and kneel down and bow. Do whatever you feel you want to do physically. Let's do that before then later in the service we roll into what Jesus told us to do and take the bread and know that when we receive it in faith it becomes his body to us and we he comes and lives in us. And as we take the cup of wine and we drink it and we know that his blood was shed for us on the cross and that as we drink that wine so it becomes to us his blood. Somebody this morning at breakfast said to me, somebody who was staying, a friend of Margaret, has said, um, She'd put um, a red jumper in her son's red jumper in the washing machine. And I imagine the red of the jumper, it hadn't been washed before, coming through and washing everything through, the whole wash. And at that moment, my first thought was, that's what Jesus is trying to do when we drink his, 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 uh, drink his blood. He's trying to... to <coughs> to wash us all through that, so that we become completely, completely full of his presence, rather like the, the, the red dye in a pair of trousers put in the wash just goes then through everything. So, would you like to stand, please? Lord God, we, we come as we are, and we know... You accept our coming. And you're so pleased that we've come to church this morning to worship you. To bring before you just we, uh, all that we are and all that we have, uh, just as we are. Because you've created us from the beginning for the single purpose of worshipping you to bow down before you and worship you because of who you are. Because, Lord Jesus, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are the one whom beyond and before time created everything that is and continue to hold everything together in the entire created order. And that together with the Father and the Holy Spirit together with the whole company of heaven, the angels and the archangels and the faithful departed, together with all, you receive worship. So as we distill everything down into this same moment that the wise men enjoyed when they bowed before your, your, your manger and worshipped you, Lord Jesus, as a baby. We pray at the beginning of this new year that we would be able to distill all our lives down into an act of simple worship. Amen. Amen. Amen.